So thank you, Ramya, and thank you, Dr. Meeta, for inviting me as a chair to third session of this event. So now I welcome to Dr. Dimitri Van de Ville for the his talk on the dynamics of large-scale fMRI network transient activity as the key to access rich network interaction. So Dr. Dimitri uh, did his MS degree in computer science and PhD degree in computer science engineering from Gehant University, Belgium in the 1998 and 2002 respectively. He was the postdoctoral fellow in the lab of Professor Michel Unser at the Ecole Polytechnic, Switzerland in the, from the year 2002 to 2005. He was also group leader for the signal processing unit at the University Hospital of Geneva, Switzerland, as part of Center Imaginary Biomedical, CIBM, uh, from the 2005 to 2009. He also received Switch National Science Foundation professorship in the 2009, and he became professor of bioengineering at Iglo Polytechnic Federal Delivery, EPFL, that is the Institute of Bioengineering and jointly affiliated with the University of Geneva, Switzerland. So he became professor in the 2015. Apart from his uh, academics and uh, uh, academic and uh, professional qualification, he was the senior editor of the IEEE transactions on signal processing from last continuous three years. He is also editor of the Siam Journal on Imaging Science from the 2018 to up to this time. He was also an associate editor in the IEEE transaction on image processing in the year 2006 to 2009. He was also an associate editor in IEEE signal processing letters from the 2004 to 2006. He was also chaired in the uh, bioimaging and signal processing BISP technical committee in the 2012 to 2013. He was also a founding chair of Eurasip Journal, uh, Eurasip Biomedical Imaging and Signal Analytics site in the 2016 to 2018. And he was a co-chair in the biennial bevelets and sparsity series conferences. And he was co-chaired with the Professor Y. Lu and M. Papa Dekais. He also received Pfizer Research Award in 2012. Narset Independent Investigator Award in 2014 and Linard's Foundation Award in 2016. His research area includes wavelet sparsity, graph signal processing, and their application in computational neuroimaging. Now I welcome to Dr. Dimitri for uh, his uh, talk on the dynamics of large-scale fMRI networks. So now you can continue. Thank you very much uh, for this kind introduction. And I, I like to sincerely thank the organizers for inviting me for this occasion. I hope the, the workshop is going well, despite these uh, exceptional circumstances that we're all living around the world. Um, so my talk will be on dynamics of large scale uh, brain networks as we can measure them with functional magnetic resonance imaging. But before starting with that, I like to give you a, a very quick uh, introduction on the IEEE Signal Processing Society because this uh, this presentation is featured as a IEEE Distinguished Lecture of the SPS. Uh, uh, this, is a, this is appropriate to, to just quickly feature the SPS before starting the talk. So um, as you as you know all, uh, the SPS is a, one of the oldest, actually the first society within IEEE, it dates back to uh, 1948. And today, it has more than 18,000 members across more than 120 countries. And of course, what makes the society uh, alive and kicking are the members, and maybe even more so the younger members or students. Um, and so the, the purpose of the Signal Processing Society is to support uh, those activities through programs, and of course, by creating uh, chapters and also student branch chapters. Um, there are many across the world. Uh, there is actually an uh, SPS chapter locator, if you like to explore that a little bit in more detail. And I, I was also asked to feature quickly the, uh, the new SPS membership uh, structure, uh, because probably you, you, you've seen this, uh, there is now a new 
uh, membership fee that is available uh, in two categories. We have the essential membership, which basically includes everything you need, uh, but it doesn't include the access to the Sigma Processing Digital Library. That is only in the preferred membership one. Um, and you can see that there is a special discount that was that is now available for students. So basically for one buck per year, you can become uh, a Signal Processing Society student member if you go with the essential package. And you also have a, a basically a 50% reduction on the preferred membership. And you can, as a regular member, have more reduction uh, depending on, on, on the country you're originating from. So that's also a novelty that has recently been, been introduced. Uh, but this applies to the essential package uh, again. Okay, so um, as you, I hope, as you know, there is a, an active website of the Signal Processing Society where you can follow up on all activities and, and you can, you can uh, plan ahead with, with other conferences perhaps, uh, which maybe today is even more interesting so because as all these events are now uh, virtual, uh, essentially, uh, you can of course uh, more easily join uh, or maybe just join for portions, etc. So there is a certain advantage of events being available now around the world, uh, uh, really. And you can uh, follow up on SPS activities also through the social networks, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, and so on. There is a YouTube channel, etc. So with no further ado on that, uh, let's maybe start with the essence of, of today, which is this talk uh, I'm going to give on the dynamics of large-scale brain activity. And I'm, I'm going to try to balance the talk a little bit between uh, some maybe more general uh, statements that allow people who are not so familiar with functional magnetic resonance imaging to quickly catch up uh, and to hopefully be able to, uh, to appreciate uh, what are the challenges in this field and how signal processing, among other uh, sciences in engineering uh, are able to overcome these and to answer fundamental questions about how the brain functions. So this is a, a very quick introduction to start off, uh, which is about uh, task functional magnetic resonance imaging. And fMRI was discovered as a mechanism back in 1991. So it's around for not yet 30 years, so it's fairly young. Um, and it's basically based on measuring changes in blood flow. So what you see in this artistic representation of the, of the brain is the flowing of blood through the arteries and the veins. And of course, this is a very intricate network of vascularization uh, that goes down to the micrometer scale, uh, what we call the microvascular bed. And that brings you very close to, neuro, to neurons um, uh, to bring them uh, oxygen and glucose, in essence, to make them function. So what happens if you're lying in an MRI scanner and you're doing functional images of you? Uh, we basically acquire a whole brain volume every second. And if at the same time you are looking in front of you on a screen that is projected uh, through a mirror, uh, if you're looking at what we call a flashing checkerboard, which is a very salient visual stimulus, what will happen is in the back of your brain, the so-called occipital lobe, uh, where the visual cortex is located, there will be neural populations that start to fire uh, because they are excited by this visual stimulus. And as a consequence of that, uh, there is the mechanism called neurovascular coupling which will locally increase the blood flow. And it is that local change in blood flow and also in the ratio between oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin that will actually very, very slightly change the signal in your images, volumes, I should say more correctly, that are acquired with your magnetic resonance imaging scanner. And if you, if you look at the biophysics behind this, if you have very short stimulus, like the flashing checkerboard, which is only here for uh, a couple of hundred of milliseconds, um, what we expect to see ideally is the so-called hemodynamic response function. 
So the, the, the small change in signal that we will record will be will be ideally following this shape here, which as you can see is very slow. So the, the stimulus is only happening in the beginning here for a very short moment, but the change of signal we will see will be reflected over the next basically 15 seconds. So we'll have uh, a very slow time to peak of four to six seconds and then getting back to baseline with some undershoot that can take up to 20 seconds. And so that's the ideal response that we can record with task fMRI. Now, task fMRI has been around since the beginning and it's still used today, but since the last 15 years, the community is, I can say, intrigued and passionate about so-called resting state fMRI. And the reason is that in resting state fMRI, we are recording spontaneous activity of the brain. And I, I'm, I'm showing you here a movie, which is a, a visualization of relative changes in the fMRI signal <clears throat> that you can see uh, during a resting state scan. Of course, the movie is accelerated, otherwise it would be a little bit too slow. But it's clear that when you're at rest, uh, your brain is not stopped. It didn't stop functioning. Uh, on the contrary, it's actually very, very active. Um, and it's very active not only in regions that you would uh, consider to be stimulated, such as by visual stimuli, those are also active, even eyes closed. Uh, but actually any region we know uh, uh, is just participating to this uh, orchestrated activity during resting state. And one particular reason for neuroscientific reasons that, that is heavily studied in resting state fMRI is the posterior cingulate cortex or the PCC. And I, I show you here uh, a time course extracted out of this uh, fMRI resting state data set, uh, visualizing you the time course over about eight minutes of the posterior cingulate cortex. And you can see it fluctuates over time uh, um, in a certain way. Now, the great thing about resting state fMRI is that it requires you uh, more advanced methods to analyze this in a meaningful way. And one of the, uh, let's say, popular and well-established uh, ways of analyzing resting state fMRI, uh, which means in the absence of any experimental paradigm, is so-called connectivity mapping. Um, and what we see here is we, we consider, for instance, our posterior cingulate cortex time course as a, as a time course of the so-called seat region. And we will compare this against the time course of every possible other voxel in the brain, which will be different targets. So let's say, for instance, we have our seat time course here from the PCC. And at the top here, we extract another time course maybe from this parietal region here in the brain. So that would be the time course. And how are we going to compare those two? Well, classically, we would do that with a, a correlation, uh, a sim simple Pearson correlation coefficient that will um, give us correlation between minus one and plus one, and that we will report in a, in a, in a connectivity map um, at the same location as the target voxel. And that will build up a, a, a volume as the one you can see here in the right-hand side, which is showing you in red uh, regions, voxels in the brain that are positively correlated with the posterior cingulate cortex. And in blue, the ones that are very strongly anti-correlated with the uh, uh, PCC time course. Now, this very simple method gives you already a very characteristic map because if you show this to a neuroscientist he will recognize brain regions in the red here that are known to be so-called task negative and they include regions that belong to a so-called functional network that we call the default mode network and that is a network that is very characteristic to be engaged in activity when you actually disengage from a task so in other words when you alternate between short moments of task activity and rest, uh, the, the default mode network will become more active during the rest periods. So that's why the red areas are associated to task negative regions. And the blue areas, on the contrary, 
which are anti-correlated with the posterior cingulate cortex, they are actually described as task positive uh, regions. And, and one of them, well, one network that is made up of them is the so-called frontoparietal network, which is involved in uh, attention and executive control. And so this, this opposition that we see here uh, happening between two types of brain regions can be extracted with this very simple correlation mapping. And correlation mapping is actually a powerful approach because depending on where you put the seat region, you can actually come up with different networks that are correlated with the seat. As already said, if we put it in the PCC region, we'll get the default mode network as being positively correlated with the PCC. I removed here the, uh, the anti-correlation port. But if we actually move around the seat in the brain, uh, we can get many other uh, networks as well. For instance, if we move to the auditory region, we get the auditory network or visual or somatomotor or high level dorsal attention and executive control. So all these are actually networks that have been described over the many years of research using task fMRI, but now you can get them with just 10 minutes of resting state fMRI. And, and, and that was in the, in, the, in, the, in the early years when resting state fMRI uh, was, was being advocated, uh, was, the, was the biggest surprise of all that you could actually get all those beautiful and, and, and sensory to high level networks by just 10 minutes of resting state, instead of having to do maybe many different tasks um, and looking at the results separately. Um, of course, once you have this resting state data set, you can do many other types of approaches. And uh, for signal processing, this is a real uh, richness. You can do unsupervised learning, such as clustering in the spatial domain to come up uh, with the parcelization, a functional parcelization of the brain uh, and this has led to, to basically uh, de facto standards for functional parcelization. Or you could do your blind source separation method, uh, maybe independent component analysis, if you're a fan of that, which will decompose your spatiotemporal data set into different components for which each of them will have a spatial map and a time course. And basically, again, the spatial maps are reminiscent of these functional networks that I, I already showed you before. So uh, all these actually different methods point towards the same, um, uh, the same evidence, which is that uh, resting state fMRI is organized in functional networks. And one more class of uh, methods I like to mention here because it, it's, it's, it's actually quite beautiful are the so-called graph-based models where you would typically reduce the spatial uh, the, the spatial dimensionality in, with an atlas. So you bring down uh, like 50,000 voxels, you bring them down to 100 to 1,000 regions. Uh, and for each region, you get uh, an average time course from the resting state fMRI data. And then you're going to compute that um, a correlation coefficient, which we will call also functional connectivity. You're going to compute that between all pairs of uh, regional time courses to make up uh, an adjacency matrix that will be the uh, characterizing the graph that we call the functional connectome. Um, and once you have this characterization of your functional connectome, you could not only look on it on top of a brain, um, which is very interesting, of course, but more even more interestingly, you could do um, uh, graph methods uh, such as graph embedding, for instance, which will in essence provide you with a topological view of the functional connectome, uh, which is not necessarily, and in practice will not be, uh, constrained by the spatial dimensions in which the brain is embedded. So, so this will allow you to see actually more uh, clearly how different regions, despite being distant, collaborate with one another. Now, this is a very uh, established uh, field of research. I would say we, we are basically facing uh, 20 years of, of functional connectivity uh, studies with many thousands of papers. Um, and, and if we look at the, the essential measure that is used in all the methods I've showed you so far, it is basically the functional connectivity measure or the correlation measure. Um, and it's very important, of course, to realize that functional connectivity 
is a kind of a summary statistic in the sense that it's uh, it's a summary over time, right? It's it's summarizing your average behavior over a whole resting state run, and um, um, therefore. It's not only an average behavior, but it's actually also insensitive to the temporal order of your data. If you would do a temporal permutation of your fMRI resting state data set, and you recompute, for instance, the seed connectivity map, you get the very same result. So that's why I will kind of show this uh, blurred pinwheel uh, representation to, to suggest that what we are looking at with functional connectivity measures is uh, is very blurred in a certain way because it's averaged over 10 minutes of resting state and there is thus a need to go towards time varying features of functional connectivity now there is another problem with functional connectivity um, which is a, a good motivation to go beyond it uh, which is the um, too simplistic interpretation it can lead to if you think back uh, to this PCC seed connectivity map that I showed you in the beginning, because you find anti-correlation between task negative and task positive uh, regions, one might actually suppose that the, the, the activity time courses of the red and the blue regions would basically be opposite, right? Because that would uh, obviously lead to an anti-correlated pattern as we see here in the map. Um, but th there are many other, uh, there is absolutely no guarantee that this is really the case. Uh, and to verify that, uh, and I can tell you already, it's not the case, but to, to, to then figure out what really happens, one needs to look at more time-resolved measures uh, of functional connectivity. And so that's exactly uh, what we are going to do in this talk. Now, th this topic has, has, uh, has been actually pursued in the community since about, I would say, uh, eight years now. Uh, and there have been a number of, uh, of review papers, uh, some of them by, by our group, but also by others, uh, which if you're interested in getting an overview, I would certainly recommend them to look at least in, in some of these. And, and it's all about, if you like, getting that functional connectome that I mentioned to you before in a dynamic form. Now, the two types of techniques I like to uh, present you in mo much more detail today uh, are the ones that emerged over the last uh, five years. And I think uh, they are particularly interesting for uh, signal processing viewpoint. The first one will be the, what I call the point process analysis type of technique, which uh, still has a focus on a selected seat region and which will lead to what are called co-activation patterns. And the second one uh, will be a regularized hemodynamic deconvolution approach, which allows us to look at transient activity as a key to unravel temporally overlapping activity. Uh, and that will lead to what I call innovation-driven co-activation patterns or ICAPs. But let's start off with the caps of the, that we get out of the point process analysis. The idea of point process analysis is to identify your fMRI data frames that correspond to what I call key events and key events related to a seed region. So let's uh, imagine that our seed region is the one here indicated by the blue arrow. And we get out of that, um, of that region, uh, we get out this time course over here. Now what we're going to do uh, to identify key events in time will be to apply a threshold to this time course and to look when does the uh, activity in the seat exceed the threshold. So we will mark the time frames where this does happen. Now, the first observation is that if you would simply average all those selected time frames, so the ones where the seat exceeds, uh, the seat activity exceeds the threshold, you get, of course, a single volume, and that volume is actually uh, a proxy. It's very close to the seed connectivity map that you would get with Pearson correlation. So here you can uh, um, observe the difference yourself if, again, the seed would be the posterior cingulate cortex, as we did in the beginning. 
Um, and, and so you see there is virtually no difference in averaging those frames where the seat activity exceeds a threshold or in computing the correlation of this time course with all the other ones, as I showed you uh, in the very beginning. But of course, this is not so useful because while here we had access to individual frames, which is basically looking at the pinwheel at a particular position, but not being blurred. Uh, but of course, by averaging over time, we again introduce a, a tremendous amount of blurring uh, and we are actually back to something we already got before. So that's not the purpose of uh, selecting those frames. Instead of averaging, we will go for temporal clustering of those selected frames. So in other words, we want to attribute a label to each and every of the selected frames uh, according to a clustering algorithm, which is typically a k-means or one of its variations. Um, and if you then um, average the frames that have received the same label and you average those frames, you get what is called a co-activation pattern of your selected seed. And if you do this for, um, uh, for the posterior cingulate cortex, you, you do get many different clusters, as you can see. And while the first one still looks like the average, you have many others that actually have quite different uh, patterns appearing. Uh, and, and if you look at this more closely from a neuroscientific viewpoint, uh, th there are actually some surprising configurations that happen in terms of coactivation um, that completely contradict the intuition that you might get of the anti-correlation from the connectivity map. So the posterior cingulate cortex, to be clear, it actually co-activates also with task positive regions. It's not that it's always oppositely activated with those. Um, but in essence, it kind of tells you that the average pattern that we had before is in reality explained by a sum of contributions of these different co-activation patterns. And you can see that there is a considerable amount of uh, occurrences that, that are attributed to the co-activation patterns that do not actually look like the average. So there is a, a lot of activity that is in a certain way surprising if you look at the dynamic nature of, 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 of co-activation. And once you have established the coactivation patterns, you can, for each of them, extract measures of interest, which could be counting how many times they occur, or if they occur, how long they, they, they take, the duration, or maybe how they transition between them. And all these measures can then be of interest to extract certain characteristics of your subjects or your groups. And so this, this, uh, this coactivation patterns framework has been used in the literature already a lot. Um, and also in our group, we, we found that a very interesting approach, especially, of course, when you have a good hypothesis on the seat region to be used. Um, and here are just a few examples with, with people in the lab and PhD students who, 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 who worked on this. The one example I'd like to highlight today is the second one, which was done by Alessandra Griffa. And, and this is an application of coactivation patterns in so-called idiopathic normal pressure hydrocephalus. So let me say you a few words about this clinical condition. So actually, um, I call this um, INPH, idiopathic normal pressure hydrocephalus, uh, is actually the leading cause of what is called reversible dementia, um, which means that those patients which uh, suffer from INPH, uh, their um, dementia symptoms can actually be reversed by um, uh, shunt neurosurgery, uh, which is in essence removing the pressure on the brain from the uh, cerebrospinal fluid or the CSF. Um, but before, of course, engaging into neurosurgery, one needs to be sure that uh, INPH is the condition we're looking at because the symptoms are easily confounded with other types of dementia, such as Parkinsonian uh, or Alzheimer's uh, disease. Um, and therefore, what happens in reality is that typically a so-called CSF TAP test is uh, performed um, 
which uh, is not as invasive, of course, as the neurosurgery, and which in principle will relieve the symptoms uh, for a couple of, uh, of weeks and will allow us to investigate if there is uh, a real post-CSF tab change. So what we had here is neuroimaging, which was in healthy controls, uh, elderly, of course, because this is a condition happening uh, at advanced age. And then we have uh, neuroimaging, including functional neuroimaging, um, uh, before the CSF tap test and after the CSF tap test. And so basically this allows us to compare those two conditions. But let's first uh, uh, look a little bit at the, uh, at the differences that we have between the healthy controls and the INPH um, patients before the CSF tap test. So I show you here at the left-hand side, the average um, uh, precuneus seat connectivity map, and precuneus is very is also part of the, well, it's very close to the posterior cingulate cortex. So again, we are again expecting the same typical uh, pattern of task negative versus task positive networks. And you see that is effectively the case. So we again get this same uh, red versus uh, blue connectivity map. And this is the average over all subjects. So healthy controls and patients. If you now look in these individual maps and you do a group difference between patients and healthy controls, you get some differences in terms of precuneous seat connectivity. Uh, and those differences are in the dorsolateral and the medial frontal cortices, and they are highlighted here at the right-hand side. So um, th there are several places basically in the task positive networks um, that, that do show um, a difference. And because in the task positive networks, we have anti-correlation with the precuneus, an increase in connectivity in this group is actually decreasing the difference. Okay, so in a certain way, um, it is making this, this contrast less pronounced. Now, if you apply the uh, coactivation patterns framework to this data, what you will do is just disentangle this average pattern that we had here into dynamically occurring patterns. And um, the, the, the amount of clusters that seems to be a good fit for this data is, is three. Uh, and you can see that indeed we get three very different uh, coactivation patterns. We actually get a first one, which is um, uh, mainly reflecting the average. So it's an opposition between the default mode network in, in, in positive, so positively coactivated with the precuneus, and the uh, attention networks and salience in negative. So that is pretty much uh, what we see on average. But then again, we see two other caps. Uh, which are clearly very different in nature. So for instance, here we have precuneus coactivating its somatomotor, visual and attention against executive control, salience and limbic, et cetera, et cetera. And so you can appreciate uh, a very nice visualization of these coactivation patterns on the cortical surface uh, in this column over here. Now, the most interesting thing is once we have established the caps, we can of course, look at the occurrences, for instance, and we can count them for healthy controls and for INPH patients. And what you can see is that we have a, a, a very strong statistical difference in occurrences that is a kind of a, a balancing, a rebalancing of CAP1 versus CAP3, which is respectively in patients decreased for CAP1 and increased for CAP3. And so this Balancing effect is also confirmed if you look at this data at the within subject level. So, so it, it seems to be that uh, in INPH patients before the CSF tap test, we do have this, um, uh, this rebalancing of functional brain activity during resting state. Uh, very interestingly, these occurrences in the patients uh, of the caps, they actually can be related so they significantly uh, relate to gait and executive dimensions. And this was done with uh, partially squares analysis, but not to memory and attention. And so gait is one of the important uh, symptoms that come along with INPH, so gait disturbances. 
So that's that's very interesting to see. So the amount your your occurrence has changed, the amount of rebalancing actually uh, reflects your symptoms. And then most interestingly, if you now look what happens with the patients uh, in their resting state data after the CSF tap test, so when their symptoms are, are relieved, uh, at least for, for temporarily, uh, what we see is indeed that uh, patients, they, they in a certain way, they catch up with, with the regular subjects, so they increase on average their CAP1 activity, they decrease their CAP3 activity, and uh, they also seem to compensate somehow with the CAP2 activity. Um, this one, unfortunately, is not uh, significant after uh, um, correction for multiple comparisons, but 66% of the subjects do have an increase of the CAP1 uh, occurrence. So I hope this is a, a, a useful example uh, to illustrate uh, how CAP analysis can effectively show us more insights into the dynamics of resting state activity. Now let's go to a second topic, which is the hemodynamic informed transients, and which throws in a little bit more of signal processing than, than we had before. So the purpose here is to look back a little bit at the signal, um, at the signal model that we are uh, encountering in fMRI imaging. And in essence, if we actually um, uh, look back how from neural activity we get into, a, into our measured bolt signal, and this is called bolt because that stands for blood oxygenation level dependent signal. So that's what we measure with fMRI. Uh, actually, this process here is, has been very well described in the literature, and it's a complicated cascade of biophysical events that from neurovascular coupling through, uh, well, from neural activity through neurovascular coupling uh, by changes in the vascular response and in the, uh, on the metabolism uh, next to the neurons will drive, all these factors will drive the bold fMRI signal. And uh, th that has been a, an active field of research um, where different models has come up which allow us to describe quantitatively how an activity inducing signal, so that's a signal which at the time scale of fMRI, which is seconds, would hypothetically represent the, uh, the, the, um, uh, the neural activity. So this signal here can be modeled to influence blood flow, blood volume, uh, deoxygenated hemoglobin, and those all contributing to the fMRI signal. And as you can see, this is actually here described in the so-called blue Windcastle model as a, a set of coupled nonlinear differential equations. Um, now, luckily, uh, one can develop a first order for Volterra kernel of this nonlinear set of differential equations, which is assen essentially the same idea as a Taylor approximation, but at the level of, uh, of these differential equations. So it brings us it simplifies this complicated nonlinear system into a first order linear approximation where we have actually one zero and four poles that describe the uh, forward system. So this is an identification, a linear system identification of the hemodynamic system, which provides the link between activity inducing signal and the signal that we measure ideally with fMRI. And you can see there, of course, a number of biophysical constants uh, that appear in these in the specification of these zeros and these poles. Now, once we have a linear characterization of the hemodynamic system, it becomes much more easier to come up with an inverse characterization of it, because uh, in essence, we can uh, get the linear differential operator that tries to undo the effect of the linear system by exchanging the poles and the zeros. And that's what is done here in this operator inverse of H, which is just exchanging poles and zeros of the original system description. Now, if you would take this operator and you implement it and you apply it to a measured bolt signal, um, right, that's what you get. So you get basically uh, crap, a lot of noise, uh, 
uh, because of course this is an ill post inverse problem um, and a little bit of model mismatch or a little bit of noise on your measurements will be enough to blow up in a certain way your uh, your result and and that of course reflects that you cannot recover what is lost unless of course you throw in some additional assumptions and deconvolution is a is a very old topic uh, well studied in signal processing long before fMRI so why not uh, trying this in the temporal dimension to get rid of the hemodynamic response function um, and if you look at the at, at the first solutions um, they are formulated as a so-called least squares minimum norm solution where we are trying to minimize the the as a data fit the difference between the reconstruction and a convolved version of our activity inducing signal which is a deconvolved one s over here and we are imposing a minimum norm regularization on the activity inducing signal and that of course uh, I guess many of you know this relates to Wiener deconvolution and uh, it, it elegantly comes with a closed form uh, algebraic solution which is shown over here where the regularization parameter lambda scales inversely with the signal to noise ratio. Now the problem if you apply this to the setting of fMRI deconvolution is that you get actually very, uh, how I would say, very poor quality uh, uh, deconvolved signals because they, they satisfy an L2 uh, compromise, which in reality is, is not leading to extremely interesting uh, deconvolved signals. But alternatively, and this was first proposed uh, in 2010 by Cesar uh, caballero Godes, you can, of course, bring in uh, sparsity. And we all know that sparsity has led to amazing results in signal processing. So in the so-called approach of paradigm-free mapping, uh, he went to a very similar uh, formulation of the deconvolution problem as we had in the Wiener deconvolution, but now replacing the minimum norm by an, uh, a, minimis, a regularizer that is minimizing the L1 norm. So the sum of absolute values of the activity inducing signal. And, and that is a, a very effective and powerful approach, despite its simplicity, because it is actually imposing um, a signal model of the activity-inducing signal that, would, that assumes that the activity-inducing signal is made up out of short moments of activity. So in a certain way, you could say made up out of spikes, but of course, again, at the time scale of, of fMRI. So not to be uh, confused with spikes at the millisecond time scale as you would have them with electrophysiological recordings. So anyway, so, so this, this was a very uh, important step forward. Um, but now, is it, is it actually such a good idea to assume that our activity-inducing signal is made up of spikes? Uh, because if you would have, like in this toy example, have periods of prolongated, of sustained activity, you would need to spend a lot of spikes to explain that uh, observation. And therefore, another idea uh, Ishii Karahanoglu, who was a PhD student in my lab, came up with, is to, um, to generalize so-called total variation. Um, and, and that is actually an analysis prior to uh, deconvolution. So what she proposed is to combine the idea of total variation, which is regularizing towards piecewise constant signals, by introducing another operator into the regularizer, which is the inverse characterization of your hemodynamic system. So if you look here at the, uh, at the criterion that we are optimizing, we have a data fit of the signal in the convolved domain, which is, which is regularized by the linear differential operator that inverts the, um, the hemodynamic system and combined with the regular derivative here which comes from the total variation criteria. And, and all this is then put in an L1 norm to go for sparsity. So what this effectively does is actually, if you apply both operators, you are getting at the level of representation that we call the innovation signal, U. And this innovation signal should be sparse because that's where the L1 norm is expressed. But when the innovation signal is sparse, it means that the integrated version of it 
which is the activity inducing signal, uh, should be piecewise constant. Or you could say it's a block type model of your activity inducing signal. And of course, if you convolve that back, you get back to the activity related signal. Um, and the previous paradigm free mapping approach can actually be extended to include, uh, to be equivalent actually to uh, total activation by bringing the sparsity to the level of the innovation signal and by introducing then instead of a derivative in the regularization, an integrator in the data field. And so the equivalence of these two formulations uh, has, been, has been shown theoretically. Uh, there is beautiful work by Miki Elat, for instance, in 2007, uh, and, and that holds for this particular case. Um, but of course, depending on the formulation that you pick, you will go with different optimization algorithms. And there is some fantastic work recently done in a PhD dissertation by Hamza uh, Sherkoi, supervised by Philippe Chuchu, Claire Leroy, and Thomas Moreau in Paris, where they have shown for many of the state-of-the-art optimization algorithms for either the analysis or the synthesis formulation, what is the convergence as a function of iterations and time? And as you can see here, the best algorithms, which are in this category here, they're all analysis-based formulations. So they're all basically uh, analysis, um, uh, so uh, primal proximal gradient descent algorithms or accelerated and restarted versions. So which are additional tweaks to, to speed them up. But you see that they clearly beat the uh, synthesis-based formulations. So that's, that's uh, I think that's a, an interesting take home message uh, for this setting. Okay, so we go with this total activation type of approach, uh, which now means that uh, uh, we don't have any problems anymore to get or recovery of the activity inducing signal because we are regularizing uh, with the sparsity of the innovation signal and thus the deconvolution here becomes feasible given the additional assumptions. Now if you apply this to my two time courses uh, I had here shown at the top, so these are just two time courses taken out of this, uh, of this data set, if you apply this um, a regularization and you look at the innovation signal, you get this very nice, uh, 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 let's say, changes over time, but from time to time some peaks happening which indicate now when do you have transient activity happening uh, at those particular places. And that's where the whole idea of co-activation patterns will kick in again, because now what we will do is identify data frames where we have a lot of innovation happening in the brain. And so we don't need the seat area anymore. We're basically going to integrate uh, innovations over space for each time point and use that as a criterion to come up with, uh, with the selection of the key transient effects. And, and, and just as a technical detail, to come up with a very good choice of the threshold, we're actually using uh, a null distribution of face randomized surrogates so phase randomization in time. But once you have those selected time frames at the level of the innovation signal, uh, we do a temporal clustering of them um, to come up with labels. And then we can get the spatial representatives of those clusters, which we will call innovation-driven co-activation patterns or ICAPs. Um, so let me show you the, the, the scheme as a whole. So for each and every voxel, uh, we do the total activation deconvolution, which leads uh, to the level of innovation signal to uh, at the level of innovation signals to time courses as the ones shown here. It is actually taken from real data. Um, and then we do temporal clustering, which will attribute a label to all the moments in time where we have uh, a lot of innovation happening. And we can come up with the spatial representatives of those. So a first important observation here is that because we are going for temporal clustering, there can be spatial overlap between these ICAPs um, because there is absolutely no constraint that would uh, prevent this from happening. Once we have these spatial maps at the level of the innovation signals, we will back project them to the signals that we have at the level of the activity inducing, uh, 
Um, and that is done by uh, uh, a spatial temporal, by solving a spatial temporal regression problem. Um, so basically, we want to get the activity inducing signal for each and every ICAP that was determined at the innovation level. And the reason we want to, uh, to do that back projection step is because we, we are interested to get the temporal overlap between those ICAPs. Uh, and it's only when we get to the activity inducing level that we can see how they overlap in time. You see, for instance, here, it's very clear that these three voxels co-activate at the same time. Uh, and they might co-activate, but they might also co-anti-activate or co-deactivate. Uh, with opposite directions, for instance, like it's happening over here. So, so this can be recovered uh, much more easily after the back projection step of your networks onto the activity inducing signals. Now, the kind of ICAPs we get, uh, uh, with no surprise, they look very similar to the functional networks that were established uh, uh, before, also with conventional functional connectivity networks. But now, of course, they are fully driven by uh, uh, transient activity. So by changes in brain activity uh, occurring at isolated time points um, that happen sufficiently often to establish these clusters. And these can all be attributed to known uh, functional networks, again, ranging from basic sensory networks, auditory, visual, uh, for instance, to high-level networks, attention, executive control, default mode, etc. And in a certain way, uh, the idea now is that, again, if we think about our observation from the beginning where we had the PCC seed connectivity map, uh, that with the ICAPs, we will be able to decapsulate this pattern into the contributions from all the uh, ICAPs that either contribute to the positive side of correlation with PCC or to the negative side of correlation with PCC. So in our cartoonish way of representing the dynamics, we are actually not only going from our turning pinwheel into a one that is more uh, sharp, but we are actually even looking at the individual parts of the pinwheel uh, uh, and, and to see how they each of them separately contribute to this global blurred pattern. So in a way, ICAPs can assemble the uh, uh, the PCC connectivity map, default mode network, and all of this. Now, a, a few interesting observations is that once you have ICAPs, you can look at the temporal properties. And for instance, if you are looking at how they are used dynamically over time, um, then if you just count at each time point uh, for the, at the level of activity inducing signals, how many ICAPs are actually activated, you get to an average between three and four. So they do actually overlap in time, as you can expect, given the slow temporal dynamics uh, um, uh, that come out of the hemodynamic system. So there is a significant overlap at any point in time. Secondly, if you would actually look at the, um, uh, by meta-analysis, at the behavioral profile of each of the spatial maps of your ICAPs, you get a, a pattern here, which we call a behavioral uh, scores of each of those spatial maps. And uh, that pattern is actually showing you a hierarchy in terms of behavior based on the spatial pattern that corresponds to a hierarchy, which is here on the top, that is driven by the temporal, uh, the temporal usage of these ICAPs. So in other words, the, 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 spatial, the spatial behavioral separation of ICAPs goes hand in hand with the temporal way, the temporal usage of them. And so that's, that's also a, a, a nice confirmation uh, that it actually makes sense to look at uh, ICAPs uh, from a transient behavior viewpoint. Now, to conclude, if I have time, uh, feel free to interrupt me if you would have a next uh, item on your agenda. Otherwise, I give you a final example before the end of the talk, um, which is on the use of ICAPs. So again, this was uh, uh, taken further by several students in the lab. Um, and the one I like to actually mention uh, here 
is uh, by Nawal Kinani, who actually looked at how we can use ICAPS not to look at fMRI of the brain, but fMRI of the spinal cord. And this was a very exciting collaboration with Elvira Pirondini, who's now in the US, and Silvestre Michela, who's a colleague PI at the Center for uh, uh, Neuroprosthetics at EPF. So maybe uh, the spinal cord is much less known uh, as the brain in terms of its, its function, uh, but it's actually, uh, first of all, technically quite difficult to access this with fMRI because it's in size, obviously, much smaller than the brain. But it's also located at a very difficult region. It's uh, surrounded by, by tissue types and homogeneous magnetic field, fields, uh, and therefore uh, much more complicated to come up with good shimming and thus good image quality. And moreover, the corruption of the data by physiological noise is also more uh, of a problem and needs to be done extremely carefully. Um, but today, with well-tuned acquisition protocols and proper pre-processing, uh, we can actually get to the level of uh, uh, getting uh, clean data uh, of the spinal cord using fMRI protocols. Now, maybe for what reason then? Because uh, the spinal cord is often thought as being just a relay between the periphery, the muscles, and the brain, uh, giving signals from the motor, uh, motor cortex to the muscles for action, and maybe sending back some sensory awareness to the somato uh, sensory regions in the brain. Um, but in reality, the spine is not just a relay. Uh, it's, it's also there to uh, monitor our periphery continuously. Um, it's also very important for proprioception which is basically helping you to, to know your, the position of your body in space. And there is other types of local activity, uh, which is not yet fully understood. And um, most of the literature, and it's much, much less as the brain, as you can imagine, but most of the literature has looked at a, a spinal cord fMRI in tasks, which has a kind of a, um, I can almost say a bad reputation because the activity maps that we get, they do not fully behave as we would expect out of the anatomy. Um, and, and so that's one observation. The second one is that spontaneous activity in the spine is, is certainly not well understood, uh, already given its unknowns here in terms of mechanisms. And so only very basic things have been confirmed. So Nawal Kinani in her PhD, uh, because she was in the lab and she saw all these ICAPS type of applications, she was interested to try on resting state spinal cord fMRI to do the type of total activation deconvolution and building actually ICAPS for the spine. And um, just to show you how, how noisy the data is at the level of the spine, here you see a uh, time course uh, from, from a real voxel within the gray matter regions uh, um, of the spine at a certain level. And so you see this is a very noisy time course. Uh, this is during resting state. But if we do the regularized deconvolution, as I proposed to you, we can get a pretty clean, uh, uh, let's say, block type uh, activity inducing signal. And, and if you do the derivative of this, you get the innovation signal representation. So. Um, Again, just as in the ICAPS framework, we are going to threshold this time course uh, to get to the significant transients uh, now at the level of the spine. And when I say level of the spine, I'm talking actually cervical spine, which is the most uh, studied part of the spine with, with fMRI. So now this is done for each and every voxel that we have acquired in our field of view. Um, and if we now do temporal clustering, we get with the ICAPS equivalent at the spine level, which are actually the spatial patterns where hemodynamic transients happen. And just as in the brain, this approach would allow for spatial overlap, but as, as different from the brain, at the level of the spine, they actually segregate in space. Um, so we get very nice spatially segregated patterns driven by hemodynamic transients. And when you map them back with the spatial temporal regression onto your activity inducing signal, we get those uh, block type signals 
which we can analyze uh, as a function of amount of coupling, which would be uh, the same uh, pattern of well, activity that goes in the same way or anti-coupling, which is activity that goes in the opposite way. So, of course, the, the, the main parameter here is the, the, the clustering algorithm, which you can either do in low granularity or in high granularity. So, um, and we also call this uh, uh, spicy caps, which is a spinal cord I caps. So we thought spicy caps is a nice title for that. So if you, there are actually two optima if you look at the clustering solutions. There is one optimum at low granularity for k equal four. Uh, and what you get then over our set of, of, of healthy subjects are actually the, uh, the segments in the spine that are covered in our field of view. So we get very nicely from C5 to C8. So the, these are basically the levels, you know, at the cervical spinal cord. Uh, which were covered in our field of view of, of, the, of, of fMRI. Uh, and so we see that in a data-driven way, we, we reveal this uh, so-called rostrocaudal, so that's from top to bottom, uh, uh, organization of the spine. So that's, of course, a, a first observation, maybe not so surprising, but nevertheless, uh, not trivial as well. Um, if you go to the next optimum, which is at a very fine granularity, uh, k equal 40, uh, we actually end up with these um, uh, very nice spatially segregated patterns of uh, uh, spicy caps, as we call them. And uh, so you see that they, again, they separate between different segments, the four that we had, uh, but now within each segment, we end up with very distinct regions in there. And if we compare these maps of the spicy caps with the probabilistic spinal cord atlas, we can actually see that they correspond to known neuroanatomy in the spine. For instance, here at C6, we can identify very easily uh, the so-called ventral horns, which are neural populations that are responsible for motor action. Uh, but we can also see maybe at C5 here, lateral corticospinal tracts, which are actually white matter uh, regions. Um, and we can see, uh, for instance, another uh, uh, well-known region is the uh, fasciculus cuneatus, which uh, here we see very clearly at C8. And if you look at this a bit more clearly, you can actually classify the eye caps into basically two categories. Uh, one that falls together with the, um, uh, with the descending corticospinal pathway, which are basically um, all regions that are involved into voluntary motor function. Uh, and and they, they, in essence, connect the cortical motor regions to the, uh, to the motor neurons in the spinal cord that then will uh, act on the, on the muscles in the periphery. Uh, so those are the ones here in yellow. Um, and then we have uh, another set of spicy caps, which are the ascending ones, uh, and they actually feed back proprioception and, and sensation um, in the so-called dorsal column pathway from the periphery to the brain. And, and, and the truly amazing thing is that the spatial resolution that we recover in the spicy caps out of resting state spinal cord fMRI is, is, is absolutely superior to any spatial resolution you see in task activation maps. Although the acquisition protocol is exactly the same um, as we used for task fMRI. Uh, and, and we also actually published some results on that using classical approaches. So I already showed you at the brain level that we have overlap of eye caps of about four at each time point. At the level of the spine, we have an overlap of about 11 on average. So they, they are especially segregated, but they, but they certainly co-activate in time a lot. And um, that is actually very solid evidence for uh, the restless spinal cord, because we are here looking at resting state spinal cord activity, uh, which means that there is no movement. There is in principle no motion. Um, so uh, nevertheless, the spinal cord is very active uh, and, and active enough to drive all these patterns that I showed you before. We can also look a little bit more closer in the interaction 
of the activity-inducing signals of all these spicy caps. And uh, it's maybe a little bit fast to go over this, but if you actually arrange these spicy caps per, uh, per, per level, and you split them into the descending and the ascending uh, uh, spicy caps that I, I, I mentioned before, uh, in terms of coupling, we see that we have a strong um, intra-segmental coupling. So you see that th these red uh, strong coupling connections, they always occur within a block here, which is within a segment. From the other hand, if you look at anti-couplings, you see that the ones that survive statistical testing, they are usually outside these blocks, so in the cross blocks, if you like, which is between segments. And, and that means that we have a, a, an anti-coupling behavior between ICAPs of different segments, which is actually a, 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 a mechanism that was often alluded to, but never uh, uh, evidenced with data. Um, and, and so this is called actually a mechanism of intersegmental inhibition between the spinal levels that we now observe with uh, human non-invasive functional imaging. So that brings me finally to the end of this talk. Um, and I, I like to end with, with an overview. So this is taken from a, one of those review papers that I mentioned before. And if you want what I, I propose to you in this presentation is only the two techniques which are highlighted over here. So coactivation patterns and innovation driven coactivation patterns. And you see that many other approaches are uh, available uh, and they somehow, uh, they of course have all different properties. We try to classify them a little bit in this diagram. Um, but I would say that it's not about which method is the best, uh, because there is no best absolute. Uh, I would say there is no uh, one size fits all, because in the end, it will all depend on your question at hand, on your data quality, and on the type of interpretation you like to, to get uh, in the end. Um, and so this is still a very active field of research, um, which uh, at least we enjoy a lot to dig into. Uh, and what is really coming up for the next years is not only characterizing dynamics of brain activity, but bringing it one step further and building temporal models of dynamic brain activity. And there is, of course, already work on that uh, with many different types of approaches, but I, I surely think that that would be a very, uh, ev a very interesting avenue to watch for the next couple of years. Right, so let me thank all the people in the lab. Uh, this was uh, unfortunately quite a while ago uh, before we had to stay inside, but uh, we could in January 2020 still have our lab excursion in the snow. And, and I'm very grateful to all these bright and creative people who contribute to the work I had the pleasure to show you. So thank you very much, and I'm open for questions. Thank you, Dr. David Lee. Yeah, so if anyone, uh, if you want to ask any question. Uh, I think there is no any question from audience. So, Dr. Dimitri, I have one just basic question from you. And uh, what is the temporal resolution on the FMRI, fMRI image? Okay, very good question. So, uh, this varies, of course, because there are a certain number of uh, trade offs uh, you need to make in terms of spatial resolution, spatial coverage, and temporal okay. resolution. Uh, the, the typical uh, temporal uh, resolution today is between, let's say, uh, 0.7 seconds up to two and a half seconds, which means that in such, in such okay. a limited time, you get the whole brain volume. Uh, and you do that for many minutes, uh, depending on, on how long you, you like to scan. OK, basically, I am not much about the MRI and the functional MRI. I know about the CT scan images. So what is the difference between the fMRI and MRI? MRI so image and fMRI image. Yes, so in, in, a, in a classical fMRI uh, image, I mean, we should always say volume as a matter of fact. But, uh, so so in, in a classical way, you will do structural imaging, right? You, you want to get to the an anatomy of the brain. Um, 
And that will take you typically a couple of minutes to acquire a single but high quality anatomical image of the brain. Now with, with fMRI, in essence, you're trading uh, a lot of that exquisite quality that we know uh, in terms of spatial contrast and spatial resolution, you're trading that away to go much, much faster. And on top of that, you're also tweaking the acquisition protocol to be more sensitive to the mechanisms that I showed you that arise due to neurovascular coupling, which is changes in blood flow and changes in oxy and deoxygenated hemoglobin. And so it, it is that interplay uh, and, and, and optimizing the acquisition for that, that will allow you to do a kind of imaging now that becomes sensitive to neural activity in an indirect way. Um, and you're actually not interested to use that type of data for spatial purposes. So for that, you will still acquire uh, next to it some spatial anatomical scans that you will actually realign, register with the functional ones if you want to have some uh, visualization of the anatomical substrate on which the activity occurs. So okay. it's really about the temporal properties of the of the data which are reflecting brain activity. Okay, thank you, Dr. Dimitri. Yeah, so any question from audience? I think there is no any question. So thank you, Dr. Dimitri, for such a wonderful talk for the how fMRI can be used on the spine and uh, that this one key hub with respect to activation and other things. So now uh, we have a one small key memento for you for the giving this particular talk. So Dr. Mita. Yes, Ramya, please share the e memento on the screen. Yes, ma'am. So as a token of love from the team symposium, sir, please accept the memento. Nowadays, everything on the uh, e-platform. E, e, e e so we are just e. giving the e-memento at this time. Uh, we have to accept this thing, na? Yes. Looking to the situation, looking to the situation. This is the current trend. Ramya, just stay. I Ramya? think slide number I, nine. I shared it, ma'am. No, no. Ah, but the screen, screen is not visible. That screen is not visible. Yes, sir. So wait, wait. I'll just share it again then. Okay. Doctor Dimitri, what is the scenario in your country regarding the COVID? Uh, I think pretty much. Uh, the same, so everything is remote, including oh. teaching and and Is it so, Yes, yes, yes. It's visible. Yeah. So thank you, Dr. Dimitri, for such talk. So please accept this event from our side. Thank you very much. It it was an honor and a pleasure to be there today. The letter so, on will share by a mail. Okay. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much. I, I hope to be able to, in the next uh, months, uh, to be able to visit India again at the Sure, sure. Time. Oh, nice. When nice. the condition Where, will be fine, we will call you. Thank you. OK, so thank you. It's always Abhima. a pleasure. Uh, please. Uh, 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 let me introduce our uh, chapter chair, Dr. Chirag Pamwala. Sir, can you please raise your hand? Chirag, sir. <laughs> Hello. Uh, uh, sir, yes, Professor Dimitri, how are you, sir? Yeah. Hello, nice to Professor. meet you all. Nice to meet you, sir. Uh, I was silent throughout the session, just we are uh, hearing you, and uh, it was really a wonderful session, and we enjoyed a lot. I think we met uh, during ICASP uh, also. Uh, so, uh, maybe I, you forgot the thing, but uh, we met in the past too, and uh, in future also. We wish that uh, we have a meeting soon. In person. Yeah, in person. Yes, yes. Yeah, that's for sure. It's it's, it's starting to get long. <laughs> uh, see, uh, sir, we also with us a uh, Dr. Suman Mitra, sir, who is immediate past chair of a uh, SPS Gujarat chapter. Sir, can you please turn on your video?
ಡಿಮಿಟ್ರಿ So all part all the participants are requested to turn on the video yes it's time for virtual photo now so Hello we can everybody. have a nice memory with you sir <laughs> hi everybody <laughs> uh, all participants kindly turn your cameras on so that we can have a nice map including uh, ramya <laughs> yes, you <sir>. always <laughs> forget, you always forget ramya <laughs> <laughs> but from webex i'm visible like uh, here i'll be at the right corner a small <laughs> thumbnail <laughs> kind of a thing <laughs> please all thank you thank you with pleasure okay So I I wish you all uh, the very best because you still have uh, tomorrow also right for the yes. conference yeah. yeah we have still a three talk tomorrow thank you very much sir for sparing your time with us okay thank you so if there would be more questions uh, feel free to send them no problem sure sure sure, sure. okay bye 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 okay, bye bye sir bye bye sir Uh, that is nice. I guess that's all for today, and we will be meeting tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. So participants kindly join the session by 9:50, uh, at least 10 minutes before, so that we can uh, continue our uh, other three sessions without any time lag. Thank you all. Participants, participants, please fill feedback form. It is mandatory uh, for attendance. Yes. the feedback form for the session 3 is put in the chat box kindly fill that 